All right, good morning, everyone. So in this session, we'll talk about Kubeflow pipelines and how it can help you accelerate development of production machine learning applications. My name is Anand Ayer, and I am a product manager in the Google Cloud AI platform team. We're very fortunate to have as my co-presenter, Willem Pinar from Gojek. Gojek is a fast-growing customer of Google Cloud, and Willem is a lead data scientist at Gojek, and he'll talk about how they leveraged Kubeflow pipelines for a real-world production machine learning use case. For the first 20 minutes or so, I'll give you an overview of Kubeflow pipelines, and then I'll hand things over to Willem for the more interesting part of the presentation, which includes a demo. Towards the very end, we will have a Q&A session. We'll be taking questions from all of you. Um, and in fact, while the session is going on, you can start adding your questions to the Dory Q&A app. I'll give you a couple seconds to actually quickly look at the instructions for adding questions to the Dory app. All right, with that, let's get started. So first, let me start with the motivation behind Kubeflow Pipelines. Why did we start this project in the first place? We started this project because building and deploying real-world machine learning applications is hard and costly because of the lack of tooling for the end-to-end -end development and deployment lifecycle, or the end-to-end -end process. Let me elaborate on that a little bit. Often when we talk about building a machine learning application, we're talking about developing the, the core model. And the, the model development happens with libraries like TensorFlow and PyTorch, Scikit-Learn, XGBoost, and so forth. So we, often we talk about developing the model and then deploying the model. And yes, absolutely, that is at the heart of developing a machine learning application. But when you are building, deploying, and running a machine learning application in production, that entails many other stages. A production machine learning application is often running continuously. It's running 24 seven by 365. Data is coming in on a regular basis, either streaming in or coming in as batches on, on periodic intervals. Models have to be constantly updated and improved upon and deployed. And of course, before you deploy any newly trained model, you have to make sure the new models are safe for deployment. For the data that is streaming in, you have to do data pre-processing and data validation and make sure that there are no data quality issues. Then after that, you do feature engineering, followed by model training with hyperparameter tuning, followed by model va validation, and so on and so forth. So what is needed is simple tooling to orchestrate and manage these multi-phase machine learning workflows and the ability to run them reliably and repeatedly. And that is the problem that Kubeflow Pipelines aims to solve. So actually, before we move on, I, I should call out that this diagram, it's not a new diagram we created. It's actually from a fairly seminal Google paper that was authored a, a few years back that talks about the hidden debt in building machine learning applications. So I actually would like to have a quick show of hands to see um, if folks have actually seen this diagram or something similar before. So please raise your hands if you've seen it. All right, wow, that's actually quite a few of you. So I, I possibly I'm preaching to the choir here, but, but that's awesome. Um, all right, so before we get into the specifics of Kubeflow Pipelines, I want to provide a little bit more context. Kubeflow Pipelines is part of the open source Kubeflow project. Open source Kubeflow is a seamlessly integrated collection of tools and services for the full production machine learning lifecycle, everything from um, distributed scalable model training, to deploying uh, models for online serving at scale, um, to Jupyter, uh, notebooks with Jupyter Hub, and then workflow orchestration and metadata and workflow management with Kubeflow pipelines and so on and so forth. So Kubeflow pipelines is a part of this larger open source project called Kubeflow. Kubeflow services are built to run on top of Kubernetes, and we chose Kubernetes as the underlying platform because at this point, Kubernetes is almost the de facto for anything that entails cluster compute at scale. So Kubernetes provides the scalability, and it also enables hybrid deployments, because 
Kubeflow can run on any Kubernetes cluster. So that cluster can be running on Google Cloud, or it can be running on-prem, on -prem, or multiple other clouds. And of course, um, with the Anthos announcement made two days back, you can actually run Kubeflow on top of Anthos and help Anthos manage these deployments in multiple environments. Um, and of course, for uh, on Google Cloud, Kubeflow is easy to deploy with Google Kubernetes Engine or Anthos. And in, in many cases, for applications authored with the Kubeflow SDKs, you can run them on fully managed services in the cloud AI platform. So I wanted to provide that bit of context before we dove into the specifics of Kubeflow pipelines. Now, the capabilities provided by Kubeflow pipelines can largely be put under three buckets. Machine learning workflow orchestration, sharing reusability and easy composability, and rapid, reliable experimentation. So let's start with the first one, machine learning work workflow orchestration. To make things more concrete, let's look at a screenshot of a workflow that was run with Kubeflow pipelines. So for any workflow that you run with Kubeflow pipelines, you get this rich visual depiction of the topology of the workflow. So you can see that and understand what was run. Of course, this is just an illustrative machine learning workflow. Um, of course, when you build your own machine learning workflows, you can have all sorts of different topologies. Um, for a given step of the workflow, you can use your own tools and libraries of choice. A given step of the workflow can be um, a single node instance that can run with different types of hardware, GPUs and TPUs, or it can also be, a given step can be something that runs in a distributed fashion. So long story short, this is just an illustrative workflow, and of course you can build all sorts of interesting topologies and applications and architectures. Now let's look at this specific example. In this particular example, just to make things more concrete, this particular example, it starts with a, a data pre-processing and data validation step followed by a feature engineering step. And after that, we're forking out and running, training three different kinds of models in parallel. And each of these model training nodes encapsulates hyperparameter tuning within it. Then after that, we take the best models trained in each of these forks and run them on a test data set and analyze them and compare them and then pick the best model. And if that model happens to meet our performance threshold, we can deploy it to an online serving endpoint. So that is an example of the type of workflows you can build and deploy with Kubeflow pipelines. For each step of the workflow, you actually have access to all the relevant metadata and metrics at your fingertips. So as an example, if you, let's take the training step. If it produced an ROC curve, you can visualize it right there. Or if it produced the rich metadata that can be visualized through TensorBoard, TensorBoard is just one click away. So long story short, all the relevant information that you need is available right there at your fingertips. For each step of the workflow, you have access to the configuration parameters that were passed in, and you can also see what were the inputs to that step and what were the outputs produced. So for any model trained with Kubeflow pipelines, you will not have to wonder or you won't have the problem of not being able to answer how that model was produced because for any model trained with Kubeflow pipelines, you can go back to the corresponding execution run and you have all the relevant information at your fingertips. And this is particularly important for production machine learning workflows. So now let's take a, a peek under the hood and let's try to understand what exactly constitutes a Kubeflow pipeline. So Kubeflow pipeline consists of multiple steps and each step of the Kubeflow pipeline is a containerized task. We're talking about production machine learning workflows and containers are the industry standard solution for portability, for repeatability, and encapsulation of dependencies. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel. That's why we built a solution that leverages containers at the heart of it. And of course, because this it gets deployed on Kubernetes, of course we were going to choose containers. Now, as I mentioned previously, each step of the workflow can be very heterogeneous, can run on different types of hardware. It can be a, a simple Python script or something that runs in a distributed fashion. It can be an Apache Spark job, or it could be a distributed model training job. Um, steps of the workflow can also call out to other Google services. So those are the steps of the workflow. Now, the other key aspect of the, the workflow is the definition of the sequence or the topology of the workflow. The sequence in which the steps should run and how the uh, data flows between these steps. How to connect the outputs of one step with the inputs of downstream steps. 
And then the third aspect of defining a pipeline is defining the set of input parameters that the end user has to provide. So the containerized steps, or each step packaged as a container, the definition of the workflow topology and the specification of the input parameters together constitute a Kubeflow pipeline. So now let's see how you author a Kubeflow pipeline. When we spoke to the target audience, data scientists and machine learning engineers and machine learning practitioners, time and again, everyone said Python is their preferred lingua franca. So we said, okay, let's provide an SDK that is fairly intuitive and native to Python coders. So that's what we've provided. You get a fairly intuitive Python SDK that you use to specify the topology of your workflow. And specifying the topology is as, it's, it, it's basically as simple as calling Python functions that represent the various steps of your workflow and connecting them with inputs and outputs. Um, I won't go into too many details of the Python SDK, and actually in the, the next section of the talk, Willem, as he's doing his demo, will provide more details about the SDK. And of course, the SDK is a, a broad topic in and of itself. So you know, I'd request you to look at the, the Kubeflow Pipelines documentation to learn more about the SDK. Now at this point, you may be wondering, but wait a minute, I said each step of the workflow is a containerized task, and here I'm talking about defining the workflow with a Python SDK and calling the steps like Python functions. So there's some disconnect here. Valid observation. In its simplest form, because we're orchestrating containers, as long as the containers follow a protocol on how they accept inputs and how they produce outputs, any containerized task can be converted into a workflow step. And so that provides flexibility. Um, in fact, we have a, a customer that, is, uh, that has taken Fortran libraries that do numerical analysis, put them in a container, and call uh, that uh, particular container as a task in a Kubeflow workflow. So, this provides a lot of flexibility, the ability to take a containerized task and convert it into a step of a workflow. And the way you do that is you define a Python function wrapper for that container by invoking this SDK function called the container ops. You call the container op and you convert the Python wrapper function that you can now use while you're defining the workflow topology. But we realize that our target audience, data scientists and machine learning practitioners, they don't come in and build Docker containers on a, on a daily basis, or rather they're not directly dealing with Docker on a daily basis. And in many cases, for the most part, and we'll continue to improve upon this, for the most part, the Dockerization becomes an implementation detail. So if you're writing a, a step of the workflow with Python, we provide simple utilities and function decorators to take your Python code and package it up automatically as a containerized task that you can call as a step of the workflow. So key, key aspect here is while under the hood each task is a container, for the most part, uh, machine learning practitioners and data scientists will deal with their Python code and we take care of the mechanics of dockerization. We simplify the dockerization for you. And of course, if you're running it on Google Cloud, you are going to call um, and leverage Google Cloud's amazing fully managed solutions for data analytics and machine learning model training and so forth. And for these services, we give you out-of-the-box connectors. So again, you don't have to focus on the mechanics of calling out to these services. We simplify that for you. You focus on your code, and you use these out-of-the-box connectors. And of course, we will continue to improve upon this story. All right, so now let's look at the second key value proposition of Kubeflow pipelines, which is sharing reusability and composability. And the key premise here is, most machine learning applications today, they're built as bespoke applications, but as machine learning becomes more mainstream, it becomes a more, a key aspect of, yeah, it, it goes mainstream, it's a key aspect embedded into multiple applications. You need a faster way to build machine learning applications, and the best way to do that is the ability to reuse um, what others, the, the, the great work that others have done. You don't want to always start from scratch. If someone else has built an amazing workflow or an amazing uh, component that can be used as a part of the workflow, we want to enable that. So we want you to be able to find it easily, quickly, and reuse it, and you're good to go. And of course, you'll customize it for your specific needs. So with Kubeflow Pipelines, um, once you've defined the workflow, you can package it up as a zip file, and that zip file can be shared with others, and they can run it on their own Kubeflow cluster. And because each task is containerized, you're not worried about the portability. So package up your Kubeflow pipeline as a zip file and give it to, say, let's just say you developed the, the workflow on your development cluster and you've tested it, it looks good, and you want to hand it off to the uh, production team that's deploy, that will deploy it on the production cluster. Great, just package it up as a zip file and hand it over to them. Um, and 
often what you want to do is, if, if you're working, say, in a large organization or you're part of a broader community, you want to build an amazing application and share it with others so that they can leverage it and run it and build upon it. So if I were to uh, find a Kubeflow application packaged as a zip file from someone else, I can load it up in my Kubeflow cluster, and I will get this UI, a UI form, that is automatically created based on the inputs accepted by that pipeline. I'll get that UI form, and without having to write too much code, I can actually fill in the parameters of the UI form, and I can try out a Kubeflow application very easily. So that's a key aspect of being able to reuse and quickly try out the work that someone else has done. And this reusability is not just for full end-to-end -end machine learning workflows or, or a complete uh, pipeline. We've actually made it such that an individual step of a workflow can be packaged up as a reusable component. So let's just say you're doing some very interesting feature engineering, or you've come up with a very interesting way to do model analysis that you want everyone within your organization to follow. Well, great, author that as a reusable Kubeflow pipeline component, and they can use it easily within their own custom workflows. And because we're talking about reuse and share, I have to give a shout out to the AI Hub. It's a product we launched publicly yesterday. And the AI Hub is your one-stop shop for sharing and discovery of relevant machine learning assets. It has multiple types of, types of machine learning assets, from models to notebooks and so forth. And of course, a noteworthy uh, category of assets in AI Hub will be Kubeflow pipelines and Kubeflow pipeline components. And just to make things more concrete, I want to give you an example of how easy it is to find a reusable component in the AI Hub and use it as a part of your own custom machine learning, uh, custom Kubeflow pipeline. It, it literally is a couple lines of code. So you first start with this load component statement. So you go to the AI Hub, you find your um, Kubeflow pipeline reusable component, there'll be a copy URL button, you hit the copy URL button, you get that URL, you then use it in this load component statement and you get the Python function representation of that step and now you can use that step as a part of your workflow when you're defining your workflow. So long story short, this whole aspect of reusing the, the great work that others have done, or if you have done, you've done great work, being able to share that with others is a key aspect of what Kubeflow Pipelines, in conjunction with AI Hub, aims to enable. And that's a key aspect of scaling out production machine learning. Now let's talk about the third key value proposition of Kubeflow Pipelines. And, and to motivate this, I actually want to call out uh, a quote from one of the winners of um, the latest Kaggle 1 million prize competition. So the, one of the members of the team that won the competition said that for every idea that worked, they tried 100 ideas that failed. And that is the nature of you know, production machine learning, it's, a, it's an applied science. You have to try many different ideas to find the ones that will work on your data for your application. So long story short, we want to make it easy for you to rapidly iterate on your ideas, but do so in a reliable and manageable way. So for any workflow or pipeline that is run on the Kubeflow Pipeline's uh, environment, um, on, a Kubeflow pipeline, on a Kubeflow cluster, you get the full historical view of all the, the prior runs, as well as your current runs. Not only that, you actually have filtering and search functionality to quickly find a past run. And once you find a past run that you're interested in, of course, you'll have all the relevant metrics and metadata, config parameters, and so forth at your fingertips. And then you can hit the clone button and create a clone of that workflow and just run that clone if you just want to repeat a prior ex experimental run. Or you can clone it you'll get the UI form that shows all the input parameters, and you can tweak the input parameters and launch a slightly different variant of this workflow to try a different idea. So we've made it very easy to hit the clone button, tweak the variant with different config configuration parameters, and run it. And in the future, we'll actually extend that to enable um, rapid iteration with the code pertaining to a specific step of the workflow as well. So right now you can do rapid iteration with configuration parameter changes, and in the future, we want to enable that for code changes as well. So at this point, you know, you've done rapid iteration, you've launched many different variants of your workflow to see what works best for your data, for your use case. So let's just say you have 20, 30, or more different executions. Of course, most of those are actually going to fail. Not every execution is going to result in you know, the, the desired metrics. So now you have this long list of experiments, and in the list view of these experimental runs, 
you get to see the most important metrics right there in the list view. So if you've got, say, 20, 30 different execution runs, you can quickly hone in on the ones that performed well or produced interesting results and ignore the ones that didn't perform well or didn't have interesting results. Select the ones that are interesting. Select the subset of experiments that are interesting. And then hit the Compare Runs button to get a side-by-side -side comparison of these execution runs. And you can do a side-by-side -side comparison of the different config parameters and metrics and so on and so forth. So you can quickly hone in on what was different about these executional runs. You can quickly hone in on the technique or the idea that led to interesting results. So that's how we enable rapid, reliable experimentation. It's reliable because the workflow itself is you know, backed by containers, which can be run uh, you know, repeatedly. All your relevant config parameters and metrics are right there at your fingertips. All right, so those were the key features of Kubeflow pipelines that I wanted to provide as an overview. I do want to mention that we have quite a few customers using Kubeflow pipelines. We have Descartes Labs, and it's possible some of you actually caught their presentation, I think, two days back. They use it for interesting work on satellite images. We also have Carousel, an e-commerce company, using it for ranking uh, of images um, uh, and scoring images and tagging them with relevant uh, metadata and so forth. We have Baker Hughes using Kubeflow pipelines for workflows on industrial data, or metrics collected from oil and gas rigs and so forth. And lastly, because Kubeflow Pipelines is open source, we actually have a vast ecosystem of partners contributing to it. We have Intel that has, for, as an example, Intel has contributed components to Kubeflow Pipelines, particularly a component that makes it easy to take models and run them on Intel's open Vino runtime. And with that, I'd like to pass things over to Willem. Thanks, Anand. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Willem, and I lead the data science platform team at Gojek. Um, so we're an engineering team embedded within data science at Gojek. And our main focus is um, building and implementing the tools, the products, the platform on which data science and machine learning operates at Gojek. So today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, some of the pains we had scaling our data and ML pipelines, and how Kubeflow pipelines helped us to address some of those pains. So who or what is Gojek? So Gojek is an Indonesian um, technology startup. Uh, we, um, we're most famous for ride-hailing on motorcycles, but we've, uh, since launching that product a few years ago, we've branched into many different products and services. So ride-hailing on cars, food delivery with GoFood, um, logistics with GoBox and GoSend, digital payments with GoPay, and many other lifestyle services. So today, we are in 15 different verticals, and we have 19 different uh, services that build it up into one super app. And um, there's one singular goal, and that is to solve every workday need that you have. So a, bit, a little bit about our scale. Um, Gojek is a, originally an Indonesian company, but um, we've now expanded into Southeast Asia and to many other countries. Um, the application has been downloaded 125 million times or more just in Indonesia alone. One of our products, GoFood, is one of the largest um, food delivery services in Southeast Asia with over 400,000 merchants on the platform. Um, like I said, we're in four different countries right now, Singapore, Vietnam, and Thailand coming online in the last year. Um, so our ride hailing uh, service has more than 2 million drivers on the platform with hundreds of thousands of which are, that are online at any given point in time. Um, and we process more than 100 million book bookings um, every month. So the scale is quite large, and the ability for us to impact um, uh, the company with data science and machine learning is quite great. So I want to talk about one of the first challenges that we faced at Gojek um, with, uh, with machine learning and data science, um, and that was finding the right driver. Or the, it's a classic problem in ride hailing, and that is um, dispatch or allocation. Which driver do you send to a customer when they want to make a booking, when they're making a booking? Um, so this is an important question because of the amount of transactions that are processed by um, a, a ride-hailing company like Gojek. Um, you, a, a system that makes this decision can have a very big impact on the bottom line of the company if you're talking about millions of orders every month. Um, so this was one of the first things the data science team needed to solve, is build a system that could um, decide which driver to send to a customer. And we originally started um, with one North Star metric, and that metric was conversion. So 
what is the likelihood that a successful trip will be completed between a specific pair of a customer and a driver? And so when we, when we set up to build the system, we, we looked at that single, singular objective. And then as a data science platform team and as a data science team, we came together and we built the systems that actually um, could deploy this model into a serving environment. So we implemented Airflow for our data pipelines and machine learning pipelines. Um, and we implemented Kubernetes for our model serving. The data scientists went to work in building the pipelines that transformed and trained the models, transformed the data and trained the models, and they deployed it into this, this serving. And we integrated with the Gojek backend, and it worked well. Um, the backend would send us a list of drivers. We'd re rank those drivers according to the most likelihood of uh, converting. And um, we'd, we'd choose the top driver in most cases. Um, and there was an uplift in conversion. So. It, we all thought it was a job well done. We, we made an impact to the bottom line. Um, but it turns out that our, our needs are actually were greater than that, greater than just a single model. And the thing we realized was that uh, machine learning should provide many levers to a business. And in this case, we had provided only a single lever, and that was uh, an objective of conversion. But actually, in a ride-hailing, um, or a company that does ride-hailing, it's actually a marketplace. So there's um, customers and drivers meeting in this marketplace. And there are many different things that you can optimize for. You can optimize for business metrics like conversion, acceptance, cancellation, costs or profit. You can optimize for the customer experience. You can optimize for the driver's opportunities and the fairness of assigning the work. Because they're ultimately employed or at least earning an income through this platform. So um, we knew that we needed to support um, more types of objectives in our system, not just conversion. And we needed to be able to experiment in a more granular way. So in a different time and place, we wanted to be able to, um, let's say, uh, optimize for cancellation and conversion, and in another place, optimize for the driver's experience or their opportunities. So what we then decided to do was improve our system, um, uh, make this, this uh, driver allocation system, a multi-objective system that has many different subcomponents, many different models, and then that would allow us to, um, on a more granular level, um, decide on a per request basis w what weighting of uh, an objective to, uh, to, to rank these drivers on. And this worked okay for our uh, serving uh, layer because uh, it's a relatively solvable problem building an ensemble uh, hybrid system like this. But we turned, it turns out that uh, taking our existing pipelines in Airflow and scaling it up to meet the needs of uh, a generic uh, multi-market, multi-service, multi-objective um, system was actually very, very difficult. And it was difficult for three key reasons that I'll share with you um, now. So the first reason was it was very difficult for us to experiment. So it's the typical workflow of a data scientist is one of um, starting in the notebook, and they will do their development, and then they'll get up to a certain point where they they feel comfortable with, with something that they've made. Um, so maybe they have training a model, and they see some good performance, and they want to productionize it. They want to get into production, because often with, with ride hailing, um, you only prove the model once it gets into production, not on an offline um, in a notebook. So, so they're always keen to get it into production as quickly as possible. And when you transfer this code and rewrite it into Airflow, one of the things that, that happened in our experience was that it, become, it became tightly coupled to Airflow's model um, of operators. And so experimentation went from the, the notebook to Airflow. And Airflow is great at doing data processing, and it's really meant for that use case of transforming data and you know, updating partitions in a like BigQuery or a data store. Um, but we're talking about an ML use case. Um, we, we struggle to scale up to the needs of our multi-objective, multi-market, multi-region system. So in the ML use case, you want to quickly iterate on um, your pipelines. You want to quickly inject configuration or data, uh, quickly add variants, you know, try TensorFlow or XGBoost, and um, see the results and evaluate the results. Uh, but this was very difficult because of the fact that um, Airflow is uh, based on chronological or time-based runs um, meant for scheduling. And so um, variance within Airflow was kind of tricky for us to do. And so what ended up happening is we had um, we for a lot of the, the, the workflows were being forked, and the graphs ended up growing, and there was a lot of duplication of work. Um, so the experimentation was very tough for us. The second problem we had was uh, there was a lot of boilerplate code being written. And this was 
purely due to the fact that the orchestration layer, um, the, the platform itself, didn't provide this abstraction to the end user. And so we knew that we needed to solve this to allow the data scientists to focus more on actually the modeling and their, what their specialty is. And the third thing that we were um, having a pain with was traceability and re reproducibility. Um, so with our, our system, we didn't have a means of injecting dependencies, so data or configuration or any kind of variance. So what would end up happening is the data scientists would retrieve these dependencies as side inputs in their pipelines. And these side inputs were almost always un untracked, and it led to us having very little reproducibility because if we reran that pipeline and those side inputs had changed in the meantime, then you'll get different outputs. So we knew we needed a way to um, solve this problem of side inputs and untracked dependencies in our pipelines. And so we looked at a lot of the tools that were available to us um, outside and um, we were already on GCP and one of the tools that we, um, and systems that we evaluated was Qflow pipelines for this use case. Um, and it, the way we ended up approaching and solving this problem was as follows. So for experimentation, we introduced Kubeflow um, for the ML pipeline part of, of our data and ML pipelines. So we split our pipelines into two. We um, still use Airflow for our data transformations um, um, and publishing to a feature store. And this feature store then becomes the, the interface between our ML pipelines and our data pipelines. So now this has the effect of um, allowing your ML pipelines to be less data focused. Even though there's still occasionally some transformations there, the pipelines are a lot smaller and they run a lot faster. And with Kubeflow pipelines, you can spin up many different pipeline um, instances runs and you can uh, inject parameters into those runs and you can even do it from a notebook. So you can quickly do a lot of experimentation rapidly um, and compare these results very easily. In, to reduce the amount of boilerplate code, um, we uh, introduced Kubeflow components to our, our data scientists and our users. So these components are pre-built by Google and a lot of them already exist that you can use to use uh, APIs or data proc or any kind of systems um, uh, for common operations that you can, can do in your Kubeflow pipelines. Um, but you can also author your own um, uh, custom components. And this allows us to, um, as an engineering team, abstract the users away from common operations like retrieving data from features stores or publishing to our custom in-house uh, in de deployment environments or anything like that. So this is how we solve, uh, partly solve some of the engineering challenges and abstracted those away. And then finally, one of the key things in Kubeflow pipelines that's very useful is um, the parameterization of the pipeline itself, which was lacking in our existing orchestration system. So by allowing parameterization, um, if, you t if you trace the inputs to a pipeline and if you, if you track the actual pipeline that executed and if those inputs are immutable, then you automatically get things like uh, traceability, um, reproducibility, and deterministic runs. And this was one of the key things that we, we needed because um, if you're tracking the metadata of a pipeline and that model goes in, the model that it produces goes into production and it performs well or doesn't perform well, you want to be able to go upstream again and back and see why, what, what, why that was, right? What led to that model performing well or poorly? Um, but let's go to a quick demo where I can show you um, Kubeflow pipelines in a little bit more detail. So this is the Kubeflow pipelines user interface. And um, if you click on the, the pipeline section, it takes you to some of the pre-built pipelines. You'll see the ones, the sample ones are the ones that are just given to us um, when you deploy Kubeflow pipelines. Uh, I've built one pipeline here and deployed it already, which we'll have a look at shortly. So these pipelines are essentially templates. They're not runs or pipelines that have, have executed in the past, but we can run them. We can start them as, as execution runs with our parameters. Um, so I'm going to click into this one that I've built for allocation. So this is a very simple pipeline, um, a very simple example to just illustrate how Kubeflow pipelines work. So um, what you can see here is multiple steps in a pipeline. Um, the retrieval of features from a feature store, a training of a model, the building of a prediction set, evaluation of that set, and then the publishing of that depending on the evaluation criteria. So if you click into one of these tasks, one of these steps, um, each step is an, a Docker image that will be run as a container. 
So you can actually see at the bottom of this page the, the Docker image that will be run. Uh, so Kubeflow Pipelines also tells you which input parameters will be sent to this pipeline and how, how sorry, to this step, and how these inputs will map to a Docker container. So the fact that this is a Docker image and a Docker that will be run as a Docker container means that development, debugging, testing is very easy. You can do this offline. It's actually can be done in a way that is completely decoupled from Kubeflow itself. And, it's, and it's, you also don't really have any kind of lock into Kubeflow. So if you're uh, moving from uh, Kubeflow to Airflow, um, th that process will be simple. Um, so, so this example, one more thing that I wanted to show you here is that uh, you can actually see that the inputs map from one task, one step, into another. And um, this, this, this specific graph has been built by both from a notebook and, and published previously, but I'll go into a little bit more detail later in showing you how to build this um, from a notebook. So if you have a, a pipeline already registered with Kubeflow Pipelines, you can create an inst instance of it by clicking on Create Run. So you can um, give your pipeline run an, a name, and you can choose an experiment, an experiment being nothing more than a grouping of comparable runs. Um, but for us, in, in terms of the three problems we had, was rapid experimentation being the first, and the third being the traceability. The, the key thing that we needed was um, being able to inject these parameters into our, our runs. Um, so this section is really critical for us, is, is the being able to generalize our pipeline, extract the complexities and the things that, that change, and, and create parameters from them. And that allows us to more easily scale to many markets because we can have parameters to define service types or the region where a specific pipeline should be, um, that it should be targeting. And, and so these parameters were really key for us. Um, so instead of uh, looking at these parameters, I can actually show you the notebook that, that created this pipeline. So if you click on the side here on the notebooks button, uh, it'll actually direct you to a Jupyter instance running in the same Kubernetes cluster. So when you deploy Kubeflow, it actually deploys a Jupyter deployment with that Kubeflow pipelines deployment. And th these two are, are able to communicate with each other, and it's a little bit more abstract from the end user. So if you click on this, this pre-built notebook that I have here for us, um, I can walk you through the process of creating and authoring this pipeline. So how this works is you, you initially start with some steps of ho housekeeping and defining some um, global variables, one of which it, that is important is defining your Kubeflow SDK package. And then once you have that URL, you can just install it with pip, so the installation is super easy. Um, and then you're ready to go. So the first thing we do is we define, or we connect this Kubeflow client, this SDK, to our local Kubeflow pipelines cluster, or our, sorry, our deployment. Um, it'll automatically find the Kubeflow Pipelines deployment if it's in the same cluster, if it's in a remote cluster, or if you're working on a local environment, you need to specify a URL. Then you specify an experiment name, and this name, in our case, will just be allocation because that's what we're trying to solve. So this will just be a grouping, um, and if you actually go back to the experiments that are available here, I've already done some runs, and they are already, there are some historic runs already um, existing. So. The next step is defining the pipeline. This is the critical uh, part uh, of, of actually using Kubeflow pipelines. And there are basically two steps to this. The first is defining the operations that will be executed. And then secondly is connecting those up into a graph. So what we do is, I think what Anand was talking about earlier, is um, calling this, this class of container op and creating instances of these operations. And we, we pass in the arguments that we, we want to define as what makes this container operation unique. And the two most important parts here are which Docker image will be run and what will be the arguments in, that we send to that Docker image. And again, this makes debugging and testing and development very easy because you can test the specific operation, the step in your pipeline, independently of Kubeflow pipelines. Um, you also need to give it a name and give it, uh, just tell it where uh, output data will be um, available once it's completed. And we wrap this whole uh, container operation in a function call because this makes uh, calling this or, or creating instances of this operation later a little bit simpler. Um, so in this case, we've got five of these operations, retrieval of features, the training of a model, um, prediction, creating a prediction set, and then evaluate, um, an evaluation step with an ROC curve, and the publishing of a model. And now the most important part is defining the pipeline. So here, we, it's nothing more than a function call. So we've just called it allocation pipeline. And the, the two important parts here would be, 
first defining the input parameters. And, and these arguments to the function call actually become the parameters that are available to you here. So if you go back to the pipeline that we've created and you create a run, these parameters that are available to you actually come from the arguments of this, this function call. So this is great for us in a lot of ways because often we're um, authoring these pipelines and the end users are not coders. They're just um, maybe business users or analysts that just want to um, do some um, uh, analysis or um, uh, just explore what an impact the model can have and, and just experiment a bit. So by publishing this, this and compiling this workflow into uh, uh, something that can be deployed to Qflow pipelines, end users can just use a user interface and, and interact with the system like that. They don't need to be able to code. Um, so then we decorate this function call with the Qflow pipelines decorator and give it a name and a description. And then importantly, we define the steps. And here we've got a, a feature retrieval step. So we just call the function we've defined already. We um, specify the input parameters. These input parameters are the same ones, same ones that are coming into this function call. And here's the important part. The, the second step is the training step, and it depends on the first step because you're mapping the output from the first step into this second step. Um, so you're not actually building the, gra the graph directly, but you're specifying inputs and outputs. And once, once you've completed these steps, you can, you can compile this pipeline, and I'll do that right now. So I've compiled this pipeline, and this allocation zip file will be available in this Jupyter um, environment. And, and, and this can be submitted to Kubeflow. And once you've submitted it, it'll be available here as part of your pipelines. But a more interesting way that, I've, that we've, we use Kubeflow pipelines with is actually starting the runs using this allocation um, or this um, compiled pipeline from the notebook. So the Kubeflow um, SDK, the pipelines SDK, allows you to run a pipeline directly. So you can just specify experiment, um, give your pipeline run a name, specify the pipeline, and then inject the parameters. And this allows for that rapid experimentation. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start a run. And one of the parameters will be a list of features that we want to send into that run. And we, we've also got a target of what to, to op this, which objective we're optimizing for. So I can start a run here and it'll create a little run link for us, and I can delete a bunch of these features, and I can run that again, and now I've got two runs that have been executed. I can imagine if you want to experiment very quickly, you can have a for loop there, you can do um, a grid search or a parameter search, you can spin up 100 pipelines if you want to, and compare them in Kubeflow pipelines. So I'm just gonna do this, uh, just so I don't lose those features. But if we go to Kubeflow pipelines, and we go to our experiments, you can see that there are now two runs running here. Click on one of these. Feature retrieval has already happened. It's output a data set. And you can see the inputs and output parameters to this step. Now, if you click on the training, we can see that this data set's already been loaded by the training step. This is a specific Docker container that's running inside of this Kubernetes cluster. And you get all the benefits of Kubernetes because it, it's running in a Kubernetes cluster. So um, as engineers, this allows us to build platforms on this, on this existing tooling. If you click on the logs, you'll see that um, training is already running. Um, but for our use case, I think I'll show you some of the previously executed runs. So if we click on this run, this is a completed run. Um, I can show you some of the functionality that Anand was speaking about earlier. So one of the interesting things that, that you, we can see is, of course, the inputs and outputs to each step, but also the output artifacts that are available to you. So one of the output artifacts that we have available to us here is at the evaluation stage or step is an RSC curve. So as an end user, you can easily drill into this um, curve and evaluate the performance of the specific run. But just doing this on a single run is not really that interesting. It's, it's useful. But a more powerful way to do this is to look at multiple of these runs together. So we can actually click on multiple of these runs and compare them together. And you can see that the only thing that varies here is the input parameters of the list of features. So here we have more or less features for each of these runs. Everything else is constant. So what Kubeflow Pipelines does is it actually shows you the output artifacts at each stage that has the same name, but it also shows you an aggregated view. So here you get an aggregated view of all three of these runs. So you as a user can drill into the performance of these runs and compare and contrast them. So if you're spinning up many pipelines, you can quickly compare them. Um, and even end users that are not developers can quickly compare them. And some more of the pip uh, pipeline artifacts, uh, output artifacts that I want to show you um, is captured in a TFX pipeline here. So this is a bit more of a complicated run, 
Um, it, does, it has more steps to it. So this is using the New York City taxi data, and it's a TensorFlow model that it's, it's training. So some of the other artifacts that, that can be produced, for example, is a confusion matrix. So this matrix um, is great for quickly um, analyzing a classifier. We've also got a, a, a table, which is a very practical thing to expose to end users. You can just quickly get a sample of data and expose it to the end user. They don't need to open up BigQuery or any kind of a CSV file on GCS. One of my favorite output artifacts is just a static HTML. As an engineer, this op unlocks a lot of doors because now we can embed any HTML and JavaScript and render anything within Kubeflow pipelines for our end users. All you need to do is build the, the Docker image that produces this. So in this case, the end user can quickly analyze um, the model, model itself and uh, just uh, use this existing um, static HTML and, and data set. Um, and then a more powerful thing that Anand was showcasing earlier is the fact that we have tensor boards available to us. So at the training step, we can actually click on open tensor board. It's one of the artifacts that's produced. And the end user can then drill into this and um, in more detail analyze their, their model and the specific TensorFlow run, um, the distributions, histograms, and anything like that. So <clears throat> I'd implore you to have a look at Kubeflow um, pipelines. And in fact, if we go back to our presentation, you can easily deploy Kubeflow pipelines using the deploy at kubeflow.cloud. Uh, it's very simple. It'll only take you one or two minutes to do that. And um, yeah, I'll, I encourage you to give it a go. Thanks.